Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is the best selling author, Michael Lewis. Michael's books include Liar's Poker, Moneyball, The Blind Side, The Big Short, and The Undoing Project, among many others. His latest book is The Premonition, A Pandemic Story, a tale of how a group of medical professionals and scientists uncovered the U.S. government's inability to manage the pandemic, despite being ranked as the best prepared country in the world for a pandemic at the beginning of 2020. The book's pr protagonists manage to push the government toward a modicum of progress from behind the scenes. In this interview, Michael and I discuss the premonition and how the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention evolved into an organization ill-equipped to manage a pandemic. Michael shares anecdotes from the interviews he conducted and how the problems that the pandemic wrought began long before the Trump administration. We also discuss how he developed the stories for his book, what his career as an author looks like between books, and a variety of other topics. If you enjoy Technovation, please consider reading my latest book, Getting to Nimble, How to Transform Your Company into a Digital Leader. The book is now available on Amazon. As a special offer to our CXO listeners, if you purchase 50 or more copies of the book for your team, I'd be happy to join your team for a group discussion on it. To learn more, please write us at information at metastrategy.com or visit gettingtonimble.com. Thank you. I am so pleased uh, to welcome Michael Lewis to the broadcast. Michael is the best-selling author of books ranging from Liar's Poker, or Moneyball, The Blind Side, The Big Short, and The Undoing Project. His latest book, which was just released, is The Premonition, A, Pandem a Pandemic Story. Um, he's also the moderator of a podcast called Against the Rules. He's the rare author who has defied being pigeonholed and is in the enviable position of allowing his experiences and meetings he has with interesting people suggest the topics that he covers. Um, one of the most noted storytellers of his generation, John Williams, uh, in a review of the New York Times book review said, I'd read an 800 page history of the stapler if he wrote it. Um, I think I would too, frankly. Michael, welcome. It's great to see you as always. So you can always tell when someone doesn't actually mean what they say when they say, frankly, you would not, there's no way on earth you would read a 800 page history of the stapler if I wrote it and I wouldn't read it either. But thank you. Thank you. I might give it a try though, Michael, just to see if you can pull it off. I mean, the, the, the fact that you made credit default swap so interesting that it was made into a movie. I mean, that's, that's really mind boggling. I guess I put it this way. If somehow someone contrived to use a stapler to bring down civilization, then yes, I would write an 800 page history of the stapler. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, good. Um, well, I do want to get into the thick of your new book, uh, The Premonition, A Pandemic Story. Uh, your last book, Michael, The Fifth Risk, was about the transition from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. And the premonition uh, began in the last year of the Trump administration. And I must say, given the title uh, and given the topic, clearly a pandemic story, I thought that Trump would likely be the, you know, the antagonist, the villain of this, as he was, uh, one could certainly argue, in The Fifth Risk. And I was really, it was, it was fascinating, you, though you mention him and you don't, don't, uh, you certainly don't give him any credit uh, that you don't believe to be deserved, but the villain in this one really is the center of disease control, uh, if, if, if anything, and a lot of institutions that were, have not been operating as they should. I wonder if you could uh, start here at the outset of our conversation with some of the main sins you saw that the CDC undertook. So I don't think of my book the way you think of my book. I so, think tell me. It, so I think of the, 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 the villain the antagonist to the to the protagonist yes. is is the system of which the CDC pl is it plays a very important role. Uh -huh. uh, but it's the 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 three main characters are operating in a world that's screwed up, and it's screwed up in a whole bunch of ways. And one of the ways it's screwed up is the incentive structure in the CDC, and and um, and why. If you'd, you know, if you'd have asked me after the fifth risk, like, okay, there's going to be this pandemic. You have to go write a book about it because it's the bad thing that happened. How are you going to do it? I would just have assumed that the story was very Washington-based and a pathology of the Trump administration. And the thing that interested me, I don't think the Trump administration did this well. I think it was their performance was abysmal, but it was almost beside the point, almost. Um, in that you see all these characters before the Trump administration uh, exists, you know, before Trump is elected, identifying the problems in the system that are going to lead to an inadequate response. Perhaps not as inadequate as we had, 
if it had been led at a federal level. But, um, but nevertheless, it was hard for me, given their experiences, to play the thing out in the way I'd imagined it would play out. So that's a surprise me. Um, it surprised me and it puts me in, a, in an odd position because the book arrives in a polarized society, right? I don't think we're actually as polarized as we seem. It would be hard to be as polarized as we seem. But I, I, th- you know, I think I, got, I have too many friends from both sides that I know if you put them in the room together, they'd like, like each other and, and agree on a lot. But when you get them into cable news shows, they go crazy. Um, but, but the book kind of arrives. I, this isn't intentional. I've just kind of noticed it, that it arrives and people are on their little stools and they've got either a story they tell themselves about how, I don't know, Donald Trump did a great job and Donald Trump's my guy or this other side, like it's the, the my mind comes to rest with my, dis, my loathing of Donald Trump and, and how he handled this. With this person on the left stool, I'm kind of partly with you. Like, I don't like him either, but that's, that, but it's almost, you're missing the point if that's where you stop, if your mind comes to rest. If you actually want to fix this system so it doesn't happen again, you can't just say it was him because none of the people who actually know about this would say that. Um, and it, it uh, so it's not a political book. I don't think, no. it, you know, it's a really political subject. But you, you, it's a it's a it's a book about it's a bit like writing a book about a war, and instead of writing about the arguments that occurred in the Senate that led to the war the, the war declaration, or the leader even the leadership at the federal for the president that led the country into war, it was it's the war is told through the story of the people in the actually fighting it on the field, and um, and you get a very different kind of story out of that. You get a you get a battlefield story rather than a a policy story. And that, and that, um, it surprised me. That's where this, that's where I went. It just surprised me. One of the main characters is Charity Dean, who's a yep. former health officer for the Santa Barbara County Public Health Department. She had a, 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 a bigger role in the state of California as well. And she's quoted in your book as saying, why doesn't the United States have the institutions it needs to save itself? And you posit that one of the answers to this question is the reaction to the swine flu of 1976. Yeah, this is towards the, yeah, 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 exactly. And it's late in the book, in fact. Um, and I wonder if you could take a moment and talk about David Censor, uh, who ran sure. the CDC for 11, 11 years, and what happened to him, and and ultimately the impact on on institutions generally, certainly the CDC specifically, as a result of that. So Charity Dean, local health officer. Um, raises this really interesting question that she doesn't answer. And the question was like, why did this institution have this great reputation when every interaction she has with this institution when she's trying to control a disease outbreak, whether it's TB or, 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 or meningitis on a college campus or whatever it is, the CDC actively impedes the investigation, that she has to ban the CDC from getting involved because they screw it up. And they screw it up for very specific reasons. They're, they want to wait they wait. They want to wait until they have perfect certainty to take any action. But by then, you've got a lot of people infected with the disease. They want to make sure they're not creating any political controversy. Well, sorry, that's what's going to happen if you close a doctor's clinic, and um, there's that kind of thing. And and but the, but she'd come into the job thinking this. These were gods. You know, she thought maybe she wanted to be the head of CDC one day. And at some point she throws up her hands and she says, actually, she says, she says, I, I'm so disappointed that the man behind the curtain turned out to be such a pansy. Uh, and that, and and the question, the question is like, how did it get that reputation if this is how it behaves? And the the I think the answer starts, I don't think, it doesn't matter what I think. The um the old timers at the CDC noticed a distinct change in the culture. Um after two events. The first was in 1976, there is an outbreak of swine flu, a new strain of swine flu in Fort Dix, New Jersey. A bunch of soldiers get infected, one dies. It, there's no immunity in the population to this new strain of flu. The experts generally agree that this is the sign of a pandemic coming in the flu season and that, they, and that you've got a decision to make. Everybody agrees you make a vaccine. Everybody agrees that you store it somewhere. The question is, do you store it in people's arms or in refrigerators? And if you store the problem, and the problem with storing it in refrigerators is that if this thing is what they think it is, it's going to kill a lot of people before you get them vaccinated because it takes a long time to vaccinate the country. 
So the head of the CDC, David Sensor, conveys this, convenes this meeting where like the people you want at the round the table are around the table. And there's very little dissent, um, not meaningful dissent, but he doesn't take a vote. And afterwards, he writes the memo just as himself to the to President Ford at the time, saying we need to vaccinate the population, they need to store it in people's arms. He does this because he knows that if it, something might go wrong, and if it goes wrong, he doesn't want to implicate everybody who was in that room because that's the public health infrastructure that he's going to he'll take the fall. Very noble, brave. It's exactly how you would want a leader of the CDC to behave. And it is risky vaccinating the population as we're learning. Well, flash forward, no swine flu pandemic. They don't know why. No one still knows why. Several people die from the vaccine. It is a political mess. Censor is removed from the job, publicly humiliated, descends into a period of alcoholism. It, I mean, it was a mess. Um, feels banished from his from his tribe. It's a long, it's a long and bumpy story for the next five or six years. But what ends up happening is the CDC's the position of CDC director goes from being a career civil servant to a presidential appointee, a political appointee. It's um, of a piece with broader changes, the, the, the general drift in the government. It is the government is acquiring, I mean, moving these civil service jobs to presidential appointee jobs. And that this is where the old timers start talking at the CDC. The way the culture shifted when all of a sudden the person who ran it had to, one, meet the political approval of whoever just happened to be in the White House. Two. So it was selected from a smaller pool of candidates than they might otherwise be if you were just selecting the best person from all Americans. Three, knew they were going to be in the job for only as long as like their sponsor was in their job, that you weren't going to have a David Sensor who's going to be there for 12 years. And the, the institution became at once more politicized, like more attuned to political consequences and, um, and managed with a view to short-term problems rather than the long-term. So you had, a, you had a renter instead of a homeowner on top. And that it wasn't that the people who ran the CDC were necessarily unqualified or bad people. There were great, some great people, but it was haphazard. And you didn't know who you were going to get. So uh, what does that cause in, in the institution? It, it retreats from doing the kind of thing or making the kind of decision that David Sensor made, sticking your neck out to make the, to, 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 that it might get chopped off, to basically try to save lives, to don't do anything wrong. And don't do anything wrong then becomes what we really do here is we wait for the battle to be over and we write the really cool academic paper about it and, and, and leave it to the local health officers to take the, the social and political risk of fighting the disease. So that's not the re a recipe for a unified response to a, a public health crisis. And Charity saw that well before Trump, well before the pandemic. And this is why she's got this sense of foreboding that if the pandemic happens, we, we're not going to handle it very well. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, so fast forward then, as, you, as you've just done at the conclusion of your response there, um, we have people returning from Wuhan in the early stages of this who are in quarantine and actually want to be tested huh. and yet they cannot be tested. Uh, it, talk, it, talk a little bit about I mean, that story. It, but this is an anecdote and I bet there are 30 anecdotes like it. Um, and they, uh, so when the, when the Americans are repatriated from Wuhan, they're flown to Omaha, Nebraska. And you think like, that's weird. Why Omaha, Nebraska? Well, in Omaha, Nebraska, there happens to be a federal medical facility that treats people with scary things we don't understand. So if you got Ebola, there's a chance that you'd end up there. And the guy who runs this place named, is a guy named James Lawler, who is um, a small character in my book. But uh, Lawler um, instantly says, quite reasonably, we've got, you know, Scores of Americans return from Wuhan in this army barracks, our National Guard barracks outside Omaha. We need to test them. And he tells the CDC people this. And the, and the CDC, it go, that, re, that request bounces all the way up to Robert Redfield, who's the director. And Redfield issues an order, under no circumstances are you to test those people. And Laura goes like, why? They all want to be tested. And... Um, and Redfield says to test them would be performing experiments on imprisoned persons. 
<laughs> <laughs> so, so I kind of doubt that was the real reason. Like, I kind of doubt he was sitting there thinking, wow, this is performing experiments on an imprisoned person. I, th- th- that was the cover for whatever reason for not testing them. Now, the same sort of thing happens with people flying back from China through uh, American airports. The CDC is there to meet them and, and, and presumably screen them. Instead, what happens is they take, they take down their names. And when the local health officers go to kind of track them, they find that like, it, where, so where, where did Bob Smith go? Where, how do I find Bob Smith? And they have listed his, his home address as Los Angeles airport. They, and, they, and so these people are just gone, just scattered. Um, it was almost, this isn't quite fair, but it's not it's just that far off. It's almost as if we designed the institution to maximize the spread of disease. Um, as opposed to limit the disease. If you and I, as a sinister duo, we're going to set out to infect America with this new virus, given our institutional structure, one thing we might do is claim is say that only our tests uh, are going to be allowed to be used and claim to have a good test. And then, no, we don't have a test. It didn't work. No, wait another three weeks uh, and we'll have you the test. And no, it doesn't work again. That, that we'd, we'd have done just that. And it's... it that that the effect of what was clearly probably a collection of very well-meaning people at the CDC was such the opposite of what it should have been, should sort of, it cries out for some sort of bigger institutional response. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, in the absence of uh, necessary institutions, there was a group uh, that was, quote, kind of in charge of the pandemic, according to James Lawler, who you just mentioned, and they were called the Wolverines. Uh, Talk about who the Wolverines were. Yeah, no, no, this is all my characters, their importance, their interest to me are symptomatic of a broken system. I don't get these characters unless the system doesn't do its job. And the the, the Wolverines, <clears throat> preposterously named, by the way, but they're named because of this movie Red Do- I mean, it's, it's not even worth trying to explain why they're named the Wolverines. <laughs> but they are seven doctors who have known each other from either the Bush or the Obama White Houses and who have come to trust and love each other and who are very interestingly positioned in relation to the pandemic, but not running the pandemic. So Lawler's at this facility in Omaha. Matt Hepburn is run, it will end up running the vaccine development for Operation Warp Speed. Richard Hatchett is, it, it runs a place called CEPI in, in Europe, which is funding to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, the vaccine development that is going to save us in the end. Um, and Carter Mesher is this pandemic savant who starts his career as a critical care doctor, who it works notionally for the Veterans Administration, but actually sits at a desk in his bedroom trying to analyze what's going on in Wuhan and getting a clearer picture than anyone else very early. He's really um, the premonition guy in many ways, right? The- well, he's he's the one who would say he doesn't believe in any kind of mystical stuff, but he would say. In the control of disease, you need to be a little clairvoyant because you need to get the signal out of very partial data. You need to sort of, there's going to be a lot of noise and it's hard to find the signal and the noise. And you need to be, the, you need to get there really earlier than almost as almost humanly possible. So you got to find tricks. You got to find tricks, of, uh, hacks to figure out um, how to interpret what's going on on the ground. But they are, so they, these people, these doctors, whenever there's been a little health scare, like MERS or SARS or Ebola, they have gathered on email and on phone calls to talk about what the response should be. And they're close enough to the levers of power that it is not inconceivable they could have run the pandemic response. Um, when, when Trump was elected, he had a, he had a, a director of Homeland Security named Tom Bossert. At, in the in the beginning, who was who had been in the Bush administration, which was a little unusual for Trump, right? And Bossert had watched Richard Hatchett and Carter Mesher invent pandemic, reinvent pandemic planning, and had been so impressed by what he saw that one of the first things he does when he gets his job is he calls them and says, "I kind of like to badge you into the White House now in case there's a pandemic." But then two years later, John Bolton moves into the White House and fires Bossert. And so the, the link between these guys and and the actual decision making was just severed. Um, so they aren't these aren't gadflies. They aren't like chicken littles types. Uh, they are real players who are just kind of sidelined a bit for whatever reason. And 
when Charity Dean meets them, they go looking. Once they realize that, oh, Christ, this isn't going to be run at a federal level. Trump is throwing this to the governors to run. They go scrambling for any social connections they have with the governors. And if you you can map the U.S. response pretty neatly onto their social relationships, Ohio, Maryland, and California, they had they had the ability to get into the office and make the case, more or less. And um, and those were the first three states to shut down. Um, but but when Charity Dean meets them, she's like shocked. She's like, "There's this rogue group of patriots trying to save the country." And you know, I'm I'm all I'm all in for that. But who knew? And and she does ask. I thought it was an amazing thing. She asked Lawler, like, "Who is?" Because she thinks the gut. You know, like there's some man behind the curtain who's running the response. Who's running the response? And Lawler says, "No one's running the response. Response, but to the extent anyone is, it's sort of us." Yeah. You know. It's, it's remarkable, uh, Michael, and the risks they were taking. Uh, several of them feared for their jobs uh, as a result of the collaboration they were undertaking. Um, this, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, and they were going to such extraordinary lengths. Two of them, including Lawler, fly to Japan to unload that that cruise ship there. Um, over, the, you know, like the, uh, with enduring the obstruction of the CDC. I mean, that, there, are, there are so many stories I left out. Uh, Lawler, Lawler becomes enraged when he's talking about the CDC, and rightly so. But um, uh, they charity charity was the one who took the most risk because oh they all took risk though but charity yeah. charity the problem with charity is she's in this position where she's not like she's not the health director of California she's number two she is six levels down in the organization and she she's working for a Democrat and at the same time she's being solicited by Republicans to write a plan for Trump and. She does it on the sly. It's a it's an odd thing to have done, and she knew that if she got found out, she might just get her head chopped off. But she did it anyway. She said every day she went to work, she was just expecting from the call the, for the for the expecting the call from Newsom's like aide de camp saying you're out of here. And uh, and but but I mean like Richard Hatchett, Richard Hatchett has got to make decide decide at the end of January, do I push this button to send many many millions of dollars to these upstart companies that have new ways of making vaccines to speed production on this? Or, or do I wait till I find out that this is really serious? And he pushes the button and people think he's nuts. Uh, so there's there was there's a lot of that. It's interesting. I, I've heard you talk about you're from New Orleans uh, originally. And, um, you know, for a long time, if a governor, for example, gave out a warning for an uh, impending hurricane, people would just ignore it. Because so often those warnings would go out and then nothing would happen and people were lulled into complacency and and uh, there's there's certainly like a, a, a parallel to, to, to this kind of story. Then Katrina happened and now all of a sudden governors put out these warnings and they aren't, they aren't necessarily damned if it doesn't come through at the same level because people have a, in their memory what yes. could happen. Yes. Do, do you feel like um, have we have we been through enough now that the there are going to be we will be accepting of, uh, you know, a scenario like a, a David Sensor uh, going too strong, so to say, with a response just because we now understand what is possible. I think so. It's funny, to, you know, I grew up in New Orleans and I lived through all those hurricanes where nobody evacuated, but nobody was asked to evacuate, actually. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it was the idea of evacuation really doesn't come up in a big way until around Katrina. And, and but now it's right. You tell people you got to get out of the way. People take it seriously because uh, they've seen what can happen. Um, so I think this is partly true about this. But imagine a Katrina where you had a polarized media response and some part of the media is just taking pictures of the part of New Orleans that didn't get flooded. And they say, oh, look, it's just a few branches down. Why the hell did you leave? I was there for Katrina. I mean, I went in two days after or three days after and, and went and stayed at my parents' house. It was dr perfectly dry. It looked like kind of the aftermath of a normal hurricane there. If all I saw was that, I'd say like, what's the big deal? You know, like all you wimps shouldn't have left. And, and um, if Katrina had been sold that way to the American people where one side saw the flooding and the, and the despair and the death and the other side saw some branches on the ground, and and nobody saw both. <laughs> um, you might get something like what we have now. Uh, there that you got. Um, I'll tell you a story. This story this blew my mind. It this isn't it isn't in the book. But I did a lot of reporting that isn't in the book. And 
one of the things I did is I went up to Shasta County in, in California, where there were, it's like one of the counties that's in lead in revolt. Not a, it's, it's, a, it's in revolt against the state of California. They've been trying to form their own you know, state, much maybe a country. But um, they uh, resi- have resisted any of the restrictions. And uh, it's been to the point where it's almost full on anarchy. One of the ringleaders of the early, essentially COVID hoaxer movement, like this isn't real, his mother died of COVID. His mother died of COVID. And his response was to call the coroner and ask the coroner to change the cause of death on the death certificate. Not, oh my God, my mother was just killed. This is my way of saying that people get very entrenched in their positions and it's hard to change their minds about things. Having said that, I do think that in this case, enough people have been touched by tragedy, enough people have seen it, that um, we'd certainly get a different response, but it would st- you'd, st- you'd have this weird blowback of people who only saw the dry ground and said, I'm not leaving. Uh, and, and that undermines the response because if you, if you Peter, preserve as your, as your constitutional given right, the right to infect me with a deadly disease, uh, I'm in trouble, you know? Um, I, I, and and if, the, if, if the authorities won't stop you, um, then, then we may have a problem. Um, and I just, so I, I, this is, I know a very muddled answer, but my, my muddled sense of it is we would have a better response. We would have a more unified response, but we'd just still be fighting this numb nut um, sort of, the, the nut, it's dumb in a couple of ways. One is you actually don't have a right to infect me with a deadly disease. That's, that's not, you, the constitution doesn't say that. And second, um, framing this thing as a, a choice between the economy and life or, or lives versus livelihood is not the right way to frame it. Australia institutes very strict controls using our playbook and they're free, basically disease free and they're going about their lives and having rock concerts. Um, that if you stop the disease, you get your economy. So it's not either or it's neither or both. Yeah. And, and I, I think that was the, that's the message that sort of like never got delivered in, in a sufficiently strong way. Yeah. And is it possible? I mean, uh, don't mean to return to him yet again, but David Sensor was, was in role 11 years. He cut across administrations. Now the people who run these kinds of organizations are tend to be political appointees. And it takes the heroism of people who are deeper in the organization to almost defy what's going on in the broader institutions to do something. It, it, it seems as though the, the best answer would to return some degree of impartiality to some of these institutions by having people run them that are separated from politics and, and have, have uh, potential tenures that, that span across administrations and, and are irrespective of, of, of uh, political affiliation. Um, so they are, it, yeah, is that fair? So they, I think that's totally fair. And it's not saying, oh, look, they're not accountable to the democracy. That's not what you're saying. You're saying you're just putting on a longer leash. This is how you, I mean, this is Tony Fauci. Tony Fauci was on a longer leash. If you want to see the difference between a career civil servant and a presidential appointee, put side by side Robert Redfield and Tony Fauci. Demeanor, ability to stand up to the president if they need to, ability to speak their mind to the American people if they need to. It's, you know, that's the difference. And, um, and you can, if Tony Fauci does something sinister, you can get rid of him, but, but you got to show that he did something sinister. And uh, it, it's, it's, I know that he's like controversial. I think he's an American hero in his own. And, and, um, and it is in any case, it, never mind his character. Um, he couldn't be Tony Fauci if he if the structure of his job was he's a presidential appointee. He had been out of there on day one. Like, sorry, Fauci, you're fired. And the reason Fe- Trump kept talking about I'm a fire Fauci or whatever, he, you know, he couldn't fire Fauci. That was it was not that simple. Uh, it was more complicated than that. And and he was able to do the heroic things that you described because he had that independence. He could <laughs> not, he could stand up to the president while the president was right next to him. That's right. And he yeah. could exp- he could actually he and he can go to Capitol Hill and tell a senator that what you said is wrong. It's, mm-hmm. it, this isn't like an opinion. This is a fact. And 
yours is wrong. And uh, that's useful to have people who can do that. I think I thought it was fascinating to to note that Charity Dean, uh, somebody who was this iconoclast who grew up or became an iconoclast as a result of the environment she found herself in when she was a government servant, uh, a public servant rather, a member of the government, um, has now started a company. She's now in the private sector, a company called Public Health Company. Uh, its investors include Todd Park, who has started three different billion dollar companies, uh, was the CTO of the United States as well. And to what extent, I, I, I've, I don't know enough about the progress that the public health company has has made to, to know the role that she is likely to p- play, other than the, the, the phenomenal uh, anecdotes that you include about her background and her orientation that would seem to suggest that, that uh, there's a lot of value in what she can do with less constraints. Um, but to what extent does it, what does it say to you that it requires going outside of the system, that it requires going into the private sector uh, in order to make a difference? And do, do you feel like more people like her in choosing that route actually might be part of the solution as well? I have a complicated response to this because I, it is, think about who she is. She, this is a person who, who took a salary of about a third of what she could have made starting as a doctor to be a public local public health officer in, in Santa Barbara, which is not a, which is not a cheap place to live. And um, who who really is by nature a public servant and who threw herself at great risk to herself into these jobs and who now feels like she can't fulfill her mission in the public sector because of her observations of the public sector. I have to respect that. Um, and I don't know that she's right, but I have to respect that. Um, my own view is that we're kind of lost if we can't reform our public sector to the point where it, it, it the charity dean wants to be there, because that's you need the charity deans in there, and that we should all be thinking about how you reform these places so she she sees there's hope in the public sector. We need to do things to bring her back, because there are limits to what you can do in the private sector in with this problem. I don't think a private sector company is going to be able to run a national pandemic response. I don't think the country would allow it. People wouldn't allow it. You wouldn't allow, you know, it's going to require access to medical information that you would just never let a private company get. Um, and it's, um, so there, there are limits to what she can achieve there. However, she could build a huge company and she could build a huge company that has tools that could be given or sold or lent to the government. So it could play a she could play a huge role in, in in future pandemic response. She just couldn't completely run it from there. So I feel like I told her this that I feel she thinks she's creating an institution that could save the country. I think she's creating an institution that's going to require a bank shot to save the country, and uh, and um, and that I'm all for it. I think it's great. I think she's attracted millions of dollars of venture capital and all kinds of brilliant Silicon Valley programming talent, and she is. Kind of money balling infectious disease in a way that I think is it's long overdue. Um, but I think she's going to hit points where she needs the only way this is going to work is if it's a public private partnership. I think that's that, that somehow she needs to reunite with the public sector for to, to really leverage what she can do. I've, I've had the pleasure of visiting you in your office, sitting in the very chair that I can see behind you, which uh, I know to your left, unless you've reframed things or re- re- redone things in your office, you've got some manila folders that you oh, use to yep. gather ideas. I, yep. I, I was fascinated at our last conversation uh, as part of our podcast. You talked a little bit about your methods and when an idea sort of like, you know, you've at least clears the, the, the first bar as being interesting enough to potentially return to, you write down some things, you collect some receipts or articles, you stuff them into a manila folder, and then it goes into uh, a stack of them, which I imagine is to your left right now. And um, I wonder, I'd love to understand, it's obvious, of course, this book, the project could not have been conceived. It, it was in the past year that you conceived of the project, found the people, uh, wrote it, and now it is published. What was the genesis? I, I, you don't need to get into all the different characters. I know you go where the characters lead you. How did you find the first few characters to let you know uh, that there was something uh, big enough here to pursue, to clear that bar? I, I'm not sure if it even like made it into the manila folder because you didn't have time for it. No, that's not true, actually. When you were here, there was a mil- manila folder over here huh? that, ha- that had um, the name Joe DeRisi on it. 
And and what had happened was Joe DeRisi is a biochemist at University of California, San Francisco, MacArthur Genius Award winner, and the head of something called the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, which is um, Mark Zuckerberg's money, Pris- Priscilla Chan's passion. And the uh, idea is that they are, with some hundreds of millions of dollars, find ways to eliminate disease from the planet by the end of the 21st century. That's the goal. And um, the way... So he's a re- he's really imp- he, without him I probably never get to even think of writing a book. Um, when Flash Boys came out, a book I wrote five years ago, a San Francisco money manager um, a- arranged to have dinner with me through a friend, and and he did it with a motive. When he got to the dinner, he said, rather than complain about Flash Boys, he he said, um, I have your next subject. I have a person you absolutely need to write about. His name is Joe DeRisi. And I said politely, oh, that's such a nice idea. Give me your card. I'll call you when I, you know, kind of thing. And he was kind of like, no, no, no. You have to go see him. Just go see him. He was so insistent and smart that I thought, all right, I'll go see him. So I go and see Joe DeRisi and he's in the, actually the Biohub's offices, but they don't even have furniture yet. It's just starting that enterprise. In San Francisco. In San Francisco, in the Mission Bay. And he is the world's most badass virus hunter. He builds his weapons and he goes after not just uh, human virus, viruses and human beings, but he goes after like, he, he solved he has solved snake pandemics and parrot pandemics. And it's, it, it's I mean... He is, everything that comes out of his mouth is a story that has a, your jaw on the floor. And I leave, and I, I was sitting there thinking, oh, oh my God, there is this guy. I mean, I don't even have to write it. I just have to microwave this stuff and, and deliver it to, a, to, the, to, the, to the reader. And, but I also thought, like, what business do I have writing about him? Uh, I got a D in biology my sophomore year in high school. I mean, really, I got through my science requirement in college by taking something called physics for poets. This is not my turf, really. And, but I was so kind of entranced by him that I opened a file. When it became clear that the pandemic was the pandemic, mid-March of last year, I opened the file and I sent him a note. I said, like, what, what are you doing? I mean, virus hunting is your thing. He said, basically he said, the CDC has no test. And we have in eight days spun up the fastest, biggest COVID testing lab in the area by a long shot and might have even been in the country at the time he did it. Um, and we're going to, it's just, so I've built this searchlight and I'm going searching for the virus. So he ends up being, that search ends up being an important part of the book. And he also leads me to Charity Dean. He says like the hope at the state is this woman named Charity Dean. Now the Wolverines also led me to Charity Dean and the Wolverines came to me out of the fifth risk. Um, the guy who was sort of a jungle guide for me in the fifth risk was, and I, these books always have jungle guides. I mean, I need, I need, I need, right. I get people who just walk me through the landscape. Right. And um, Max Steyer, who runs something called the partnership for public service, which is engaged in the very unusual enterprise of trying to fix the federal government from outside the federal government. But he, and the bargain, he knows more about the federal government than anybody on the planet. I called him and he said, you got to talk to my uncle. His uncle is Richard Danzig, who's a former U.S. Navy secretary. He says, my uncle is obsessed with this subject. He knows everything having to do with pandemic response. And Richard Danzig, when I get a hold of him, says, you got to talk to the Wolverines. Who are the Wolverines? And so that, that, that's, that's how that started. It was a while before I saw how it all lined up. And the, for me, the big moment was when I realized that I don't need to wait till the end of the pandemic to write this story because the end of the pandemic for all these people is about June of last year when they realize the battle's over, um, that their pandemic kind of ends then. So the story is everything leading up to then. And more than half the book, I mean, it's pay, you're at page 180 before you even get to the pandemic. Most of the book is, a, is like the lead up in these people's lives to this event they prepare, that they, they, they're prepared for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fascinating. I, I, it's, it is a, as, as is typical in your books, a fascinating cast of characters and the way in which they get sort of woven together. Uh, really interesting. You've got a, you've got a scientist who works with his daughter 
um, a, a, a teenager on the development of, a, of an algorithm. Um, I mean, it, anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil all the details for those who will read it, but it's, it's, it's fascinating the people that you've uncovered as part of this. It was, um, it was, there came a moment. I, so I feel when I'm working on these things, I, I, I feel like, um, the feeling I get is I am in a kind of match with my material and the material is on the other side of like a, a, a tennis net. And I, when I'm playing with material, it's better than me. It raises my game. And this is the best material I have ever played with. And it just, it, I, I could feel them raising my game in, and this explains a very odd sensation I've had for the last year, which is exhilaration. Like, why the hell am I exhilarated in the middle of a pandemic? And it was because I had I got engaged with this thing that was just a thrill. I mean, imagine if you get to go hit with Roger Federer. You know, it, it is a thrill, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it was like a thrill to engage with this these people. Um, and a, a, a joy. It was a joy to write. I remember you saying something similar uh, about the Undoing Project. And, Same. Uh, yeah. The difference there, there's a difference though. It turned out that the science, I mean, touch wood, God, someone's may uncover some horrible scientific error, but so far not so good. Um, the science wasn't that hard to understand and convey. There's something about biology uh, that, especially at the level at which I needed to convey it. Um, the problem with Kahneman and Tversky was that um, the contents of their minds that I was trying to get across I wasn't playing Roger Federer in tennis. I was playing high lie with with without a stick or whatever you play high lie with. I was I was so overmatched by the material that like I couldn't return this. I couldn't get going. You know, in some way, I had that feeling like oh. Um, in this case, it was like he was. It was I was playing with an exceptional player who with whom I could still rally. Uh, and it, it, so this didn't feel, it didn't feel uncomfortable in the same way. Got it. Very interesting. Um, since you and I were last together, you started a podcast against the rules, which is fantastic. Um, you've in the past, you've had audible books, you've, you've still write for periodicals, uh, from time to time as well. Um, how do you think about, uh, you know, where you're emphasizing what, how are you spreading yourself now across, uh, uh multiple media? And are there any conclusions you're drawing about, new ways of, of, of telling stories that are, that are more or less compelling as a result of that? There's a very slight, the answer is not too much, but there's a very slight drift towards the ear. That's, that is, that is more and more people are encountering whatever I write through their ears rather than through their eyes. And it's a different emotional experience. It's a more emotional experience. Um, so there is a more, because of the podcast, I'm more alive to how things sound. Um, and it's, I, it's actually a useful pressure in my, in, in the, in the, just the creation of the prose. Um, I don't want to stop writing books for the eye that it isn't that it's just like a, a little bit of a pressure. The pattern in my writing life has been the same from the beginning that after I write a book, I think it's really important not to just go write another book. I think it's really important to say it's okay if you never write another book, that you have to have a really good reason to write a book because there are already too many books. And um, and maybe that's not the thing for me to do again. Maybe I should just stop writing books. So the way you do that is by giving yourself so something else to do that gets you off the hook of writing a book. And the something else has for a long time been screenplays, most of which, actually, none of which ever got made most. Uh, I mean, I'm like a failed screenwriter. I've gotten paid for them, but they've never, they've never gotten made. Um, but it's cut, it's been really a really interesting uh, literary exercise and it flexes muscles that I don't normally get to use. Now the podcast has basically replaced that. And um, the podcast gets made, the podcast gets made, which is great. So it gives me a break between books and a, an opportunity to just leave myself the option of not doing it. Now, I, I don't feel like I shouldn't still be writing books, but there may come a time. Um, and so it's, that's, it's, the, it's that space. So I just try to alternate a bit. Cross, it's it's, it's cross-training. It's cross-training for writers. Yeah. Do you, right. feel, do, you, do you feel any pressure with each book that comes out? You have such an enormous uh, audience. You have 
uh, you know, it's like an event. It's like a movie coming out for a lot of people. The latest Michael Lewis book. Do you do you feel a burden of that that reputation or expectation to any great degree? I mean, I think you've delivered with what you've produced here. So let me show you my cards. But but uh... <laughs> so um, I don't. Um, I live in a pretty small world. I don't. I'm not constantly reminded that I write best selling books, and I'm basically kind of reminded by my family I'm insignificant. Uh, if to the extent, no, really, to the extent that I'm reminded of anything, it's sort of like, like, all right, dad's here. He's boring. Um, uh, and so it's not, uh, I'm not sitting here thinking, oh, like it's a Michael Lewis book. I, I really don't think that I do think I've got to, uh, the responsibility of entertaining myself. Like I do feel that responsibility. Like if, and I have always assumed that if I like it, other people will like it. Uh, but I, so it isn't a burden. I mean, if it was a burden, I would be, it, I'd probably be paralyzed, right? I'd probably, oh, like, how can I top that? I don't think of it that way. I think of it as each one's different. Each one has its own challenges. Each one will have its own little successes and little failures internal to it. Um, that my job is to, it's like an athlete's job. My job is to go out and leave it all in the field. And, uh, and find something that's worth leaving it all on the field for that. Once those th conditions are satisfied, you know, I'm on pins and needles like every other author when a book comes out, like, how's it going to do? Um, and, but I can't, that I can't control. Uh, so I tend to try to, I tend to usually hold it pretty lightly. Hmm. The, the exception is as my publisher would tell you like eight days into a book tour when I haven't slept and I mean, I'm, I'm in a pissy mood that sometimes I don't hold it as lightly as I should, but basically in the end, I end up, I end up kind of forgetting about it. Like, all right, that was, that was the, that was money ball. It's done. You know, I time to move on. Yeah. 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 And what, what are you working on now? Nothing. I'm talking to you. <laughs> How can I work if I'm not, if I'm talking to you. I'm, 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 I, the next thing I will do when I get back to work is, um, is the third season of against the rules of the mm. podcast. And I, uh, and that will take the next four or five months mm -hmm. uh, and be a total pleasure, at which point maybe I'm an author and maybe I'm not. But I hope I'll find I'll, I'll, I hope something will walk in the door. Yeah. Yeah. We should all we should all be so lucky to have, to find our calling and to take such a joy out of the work that we do, Michael. It's I, I, I from each of our conversations, I'm I'm amazed uh, that you you've given yourself this through, through your hard work and your talent and ability to go find stories that interest you. And in so do, doing, find stories that interest us. It's been a, you know, I love what I do. And um, I really, really love what I do. And that's just, I hope, I hope my children find that. I think it's, it's, it's just a matter of luck, really, if you find the thing that you love to do. But it isn't a matter of luck to decide to do it. And I, I, I just think you really can't underestimate the power of loving what you do. It causes you to do stuff, to, to treat it in a different way than if you're just going through the motions. Or it's just a job. Um, so that's, been, it's just been, I feel like lucky beyond belief to have found something like this. Yeah, that's really great. Well, Michael Lewis, I'm, I'm honored to continue to have an opportunity to speak with you from time to time. I really appreciate you taking a little time with me. I hope I have the honor of sitting in that chair behind you when it's a little bit safer to do so, but uh, congratulations on a, on a terrific book. And thank you so much for taking time with me today. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, All good. right, Peter. Yeah. Thank you so much. No, All I, right. Always a I, pleasure. I, 